uh, bit banding it's also a method of performing atomic bitwise modifications to memory so uh, actually uh, that's why i start i said like uh, this is going to be a boring theory so these all are like uh, this is from manual so reference manual you can also read that if you are not interested to um, listen this but um, just i will go through um, so here arm cortex m3 features uh, one mb area in sram memory called bit band region um, so here you can see so for example how they divide the memories for example here we have the bit band alias uh, that is uh, holding 32 mb and we have the bit band region with one mb capacity and here we have sram and the code uh, in this region each bit can be accessed individually so individually you can access each bit and also you can make the bitwise modifications so because uh, inside it's just going to be everything is a circuit level right in terms of transistors so each sram will have one inverter in the back to back connection So here you have the right line. And here you can have the read line if you. And here you can write the data whenever the right line is high, whatever the data zero or one is there and it will just come to this node and it will be stored here. And whenever you want, to, so here we have the correct transistor sizing. You know, this is a, a not gate, right? So it's just a simple CMOS. This is the NMOS, uh, sorry, this is the PMOS bubble, and this is the NMOS. And this is the VDD. Maybe it's a plus five volt. So it's uh, up to you uh, what kind of power supply you are giving to the microcontroller. So, so the VDD will be different. So maybe this is plus five or plus 3.2 uh, volt. And here is the ground and here is the input. So this is what uh, I just uh, made it shortly here. And the data will be stored here, zero or one. And whenever you need the data, then you use the address bus and then you are just reading this data and placing in the data bus. The data will be in the data bus because the memory is going to be an array. It's a lot of uh, rows and lots of columns. So in each row, we are storing the bits, the data. So we should know which data we want and it's stored in which address. And we have to call that or read that correct data and then put it in the data bus and then take it to the uh, ALU or CPU to process. Here, what I am saying here, each bit you can alter. Uh, so it means you are changing the data here bitwise. So that is also possible uh, in microcontrollers. Then you have to be really a master of uh, reference manual and understand the reference manual, uh, what are the possibilities or what are the uh, permission you have. So for example, here you have this 0, x, 2, 3, f, 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 and so on. So here maybe you can change this data, the second bit. So that is x, maybe it indicates don't care, just for example. So you can only alter the second bit in this uh, row. So that is why you have to read the manual and then check uh, what are the possibilities. You really don't need to do uh, that much, but uh, this is just for your information. Um, so to access to bit band region bits, uh, you need to do, uh, so via an alias to region, uh, where each word in this region is an alias to one bit in the bit region. So if you already stored the word, uh, one word will have so many, uh, so each row is indicating one word. And there are so many columns. So if you remember last semester, uh, I taught about the content addressable memory. So we talked about the memory array. So I told you about M words by N bits. Remember in the computer networks? So M words by N bits means what? 
so we have m number of rows it means m number of words and we have n number of lines if it's a 8 bit uh, mcu then we will have eight columns so you can store eight bits here maybe 0 1 0 0 0 0 1 1 so i can store eight bits so this will indicate specific meaning so if you convert this into the numerical value what will be the numerical value here so 8421 um 248 16 32 64 128 so then you can just see wherever you have one you can just take this value separately here and then you can add them together. So when an interrupt is fired, the main code context is saved. Uh, there is the main program uh, to the stack. So you remember stack register. Now you know why we are using stack register. And the processor branches to the corresponding interrupt vector uh, to start executing the ISR handler. I also told you what is ISR in the previous slide. Remember, in the beginning, we talked about ISR interrupt the service routine. So we are here now. So the same thing actually here, uh, whenever we have the interrupt, we stop the main program and then we are executing the interrupt first, uh, but uh, we have to have some, we have to store the current status of the main program and then we go to this uh, interrupt and then we complete the execution of interrupt request and then we come back to the main program that is the complete logic um, so here i have given uh, with some more explanation at the end of the isr the context saved in the stack is popped out the end of the isr means so after you complete the interrupt service routine you are just jumping back to this uh, main program so the processor can uh, resume to the main uh, program or main code instructions however if a new exception is already pended so before you execute this particular except uh, the interrupt request you already get another interrupt then what will happen the context push and pop are skipped so it will start to execute the second interrupt and the processor handler, the second ISR, without any additional overhead. This is called a tail chaining. So one after another. So you are getting one interrupt. Before you complete that, you already got another interrupt. So you cannot really jump back to the main program. Instead, you have to do the second interrupt processing. Then if you have another third interrupt, then you have to process that. So tails is like a tail chaining. So it's one after another. And it requires six cycles on Cortex M3, M4 processors uh, totally, and uh, which is a huge speed up in the performance and enhanced the interrupt response time greatly. So here I had given some example. Uh, so here you can see IRQ1, that is the interrupt one request. Here you have the interrupt two request. And here, this is the base CPU. So how the core is going to execute now? This is the foreground. Foreground means what? That is the main program. So now I am getting this interrupt, right? The clock signal is high. So then what I am informing to the main program, the CPU, I got the interrupt. So we need to handle this. So immediately it will push this request into this uh, CPU and then it will start to process this ISR1. Uh, sorry, we will put the status into this ISR1 and then we will start to execute this IRQ1. So in this period, IRQ1 is active because we are executing this. And then later on, what will happen? We have the tail chaining. It means we have another request immediately. So IRQ2. So then I am putting the current status again into this ISR2 service routine, and then I'm executing this IRQ2. So now IRQ is active. So now again, I get from the status register, this is popping up after I complete this. This is popping up. So I am getting the same location where I stopped the main program. So then I start to execute the main program again. This is the main program. Then everything is okay. 
So I stopped at maybe a uh, code number 10,100. So I just jump back to the same location and then I start to locate this, uh, execute this main program. So <laughs> the tail chaining can accept maximum six cycles. So if you want to read more detail about this, how to handle multiple interrupts, I had given the link here. So I, re I refer so many different sources. So you can also go into these sources and read more detail. And the NV configuration provides a fast response to interrupt requests, allowing an application to quickly serve incoming events. What is incoming events? They, they are interrupts. So whenever some event happens, exception happens or interrupt happens, we are responding immediately and we are executing them. So we are giving fast response. How we can do this fast response? Through this NVIC. So NVIC will help you to set up the priority, which one is first, which one is next, and how to stop uh, the main program and so on. A separate unit called CFG is, uh, is in charge of combining several interrupts onto the same interrupt line. Yes, um, so it's a straightforward, I think. Uh, done on three steps. Uh, how can we do that? Configure the exception in vector table and configure the NVIC registers and configure the peripherals. So these all are, when you do the programming, you will do that. So how can you configure uh, in uh, registers and peripherals? And this is the example uh, vector table, exception vector table. So here you can see the numbers and here these are the tasks, exception types. For example, when you process uh, suddenly, if you want to reset, so you click the reset button. So if you, re if you click the reset button, then what is happening? So the reset register immediately giving the interrupt to the CPU. Then the CPU should immediately stop whatever the CPU is processing at the moment and then it should just come back to the uh, reset mode. So here you can see the priorities. Uh, so minus three, minus two, minus one. So if you set the minus three, then that is the highest priority. The reset is always the most high priority because whenever you click the reset, then everything should come back to the uh, reset mode, the default mode. And this is also fixed. You cannot really change this. Reset is always high priority. So the designer, design engineer, they fix that. You cannot change. And the NMI, it's the minus two. That's the second level priority. And then the hard fault or hardware fault. So here, this is minus one. Uh, it means this is the another level of priority. And then, and so on. So you can see the levels of priorities. So it's just coming from, this is the highest one to the lowest level. And this one is seven to 10 is reserved means the, this is for emergency or user can also program this. And types of priority. So this is uh, fixed. It means user, you cannot change. And setable means you can set the priority. For example, the memory manager fault, you can set the priority, whatever you want. So if you want to set the highest priority, you can set minus two, for example, but you want to set the another priority, lowest priority. You, you want you can if you want to set, you can set the lowest priority. So that is called setable. So it, it's not fixed. You can set whatever value you want. It's flexible. Uh, so you can check each one has a, a meaning here. So what is possible to set? What is not possible to set? So only these three uh, parameters you cannot change. Other than that, everything else is uh, flexible user can set the priority. So here is the description, reset means what, and for each uh, type, I had given the uh, description here. It's containing um, interrupt control, IRQ set, clear, IRQ pending, active, priority, uh, system control, system priority, um, fault status, and so on. So here you can see IRQ means what? IRQ means interrupt registers. 